This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kevin Savitz. Steve Robinson is the author of two games that were published by Atari Program Exchange, Digger Bonk and Bean Machine. Digger Bonk was first available in the spring 1983 APX catalog. Bean Machine first appeared in the summer 1983 APX catalog, where it won third prize in the entertainment category. This interview took place on June 13th, 2016. I was a kind of a kind of a technical guy in high school. So I, I got I got interested in computers in high school. I took a computer programming class. And that was uh, an eye opener. we uh, we had a IBM sixteen twenty second generation computer in our high school, donated to the high school from IBM by IBM. And so I learned Fortran on that and I tried to learn a little bit of the assembly language they had, which was not very well documented. I didn't get too much out of that, but it was fun. I went on to college, and then I decided to go into, I had been planning to go into electrical engineering until I took the computer programming class. And so I, I switched my mind at the last second and decided to do both electrical engineering and, and computer science in college. So fun. That, was, that was the beginning of it. Okay. All right. And at what point did you get into personal computers? A uh, really long, long time. I was a mainframe programmer for, for quite a while. I was um, an engineer at Honeywell down in Phoenix, and they, that's where they built their, uh, their mainframe computers and they wrote the software. So I, I had a, a chance to do both sides of that when I was working there. I was a systems programmer and did a lot of operating system code, and then I switched and uh, designed some hardware for them. And then I got really tired of Phoenix, so I moved up to Portland. Much better weather. <laughs> I like it a lot more up here in Portland than I did down there. And uh, just continued working in, in kind of the mainframe as a career for a company here in Portland. I think I'll keep them main- nameless for now. I'll probably let it slip later. <laughs> okay. And uh, not that there's anything. It's okay. I just, sure. they don't need to be part of this. Okay. They, weren't in, they weren't into my Atari career at all. So, sure. Uh, so, what, what do you do now? For this unnamed company, I'm well. I'm retired now. Oh, okay. I'm really old, so you can tell by looking at me. And uh, so, um, I was I was their systems programmer on their mainframe at their offices. They're a pretty big company, actually. Okay. And then I became a, their technical support manager, and then I went into networking. So all the way through from the days that modems had to be registered, you know, mm-hmm. to be plugged in. Sure. And uh, and that and then uh, I left them just a uh, five I don't know gosh it was eighteen years ago I guess wow All I was right. younger I was a younger guy then I actually <laughs> we actually hung it up for good nice so so you worked for Nike or Intel I assume <laughs> no it okay. wasn't either of those but it was a a large international company hmm. well no national not international. I'm in Portland too. I don't know if you. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah we talked about that a little right. bit on the uh, emails. Um, so, what do you do? How do you keep yourself busy today now that you're retired? Oh, mostly I just play with my grandkids. Nice. I, I, I'm pretty much out of things. I don't do much of anything. Go to coffee with old friends from time to time, and uh, just uh, my wife and I like to go for walks, and I like to play with my grandchildren. So, nice. That's about it. That's my life. It's really boring. No, it sounds good. It is good. Yeah. Um, okay, so how did you find the Atari computer? Hmm. I don't really remember how I found it. I just I remember being in a job where I was working that was not as technical as as I had had it. Been promoted into management, so I'm I'm struggling with uh, trying to manage people and and paperwork instead of writing code. So I decided I'd get a hobby, and I. I don't know how I picked the Atari. I just did and bought one, but an Atari 800, and decided to write some code just for fun. And um, it was a lot of fun, too, I might, might say. I spent the whole summer, I think that was the summer of 82. I don't know if you have, when my games were published, they probably published in 83, maybe. I don't really know. I forget. Digger Bonk was uh, spring of 1983. Okay. So I wrote that in the summer of 82, basically. Okay. And what I remember about that is my first son was born in May. Mm-hmm. And I don't think 
I didn't spend as much time with him as I should have, I guess. I, I coded. I'll, I come home from work, sit down at my computer in, in the office and code until 2 o'clock in the morning and uh, write, uh, do a final assembly of my code to make sure I, I had a clean one and then go to bed, get up in the morning, go to work, come back home, start working on my computer again. I didn't mow the lawn once that summer. It was really bad. So <laughs> a lot of fun though. Wow. Did, were you just doing it for enjoyment? Or did, did you have a commercial product in mind or were you just messing around? No, it was just for fun. And that's, that's it. I just needed something to occupy my time and satisfy my technical uh, curiosity, I guess. Right. And both of your games are all machine language, right? Yeah. So. I, yeah, I got, I started when I first got the machine. I think it came with the basic I can't remember for sure, but I believe it came basic. And I tried that out for about two days, and I realized this wasn't going to cut it. So I, I just put that aside, bought an assembler, macro assembler, AMAC, I think it was called, came on a floppy disk. And um, my first challenge was figuring out how to learn the language and how to deal with it. So somehow I found out and got a copy of De Re Atari, which was my lifesaver. I had to have that. I mean, I wouldn't have been able to do any of this without the Atari. And I think that was the only book I ever bought with the Atari on how to program it or whatever. It had all the information I needed. And, uh, yeah, I just started doing Assembler because I was, I'm an old Assembler programmer anyway, so that, that was pretty easy. Right. Once, I, once I had the mnemonics and stuff, and I, could, I knew the, somewhat of the structure of the, um, of the machine. So, where did the idea for Digger Bonk come from? Did you, was it, oh, uh, just tell, me, tell me that story. I think I just tried to think of something that I could program and it sounded interesting. It's it it a scrolling maze game, in case somebody's watching and doesn't know what it is. It's a scrolling maze game. And you try to manipulate this uh, guy, I guess, through the maze before he dies. And the thing about the game is you always die because it goes faster and faster and faster. It's just impossible at some point to keep up with it. And along the way, you encounter things that get in your way and blow up and things like that. And you have to kind of dodge them and stuff. Right. And you have to it's, kind of like beat the scroll, right? So you yeah. Go off yeah. The bottom. yeah. Right. So have you played it? Yes, I played it this morning. Well, oh, you did? Yeah. How'd you do I, that? Uh, emulator. Oh, okay. Yeah. Desk. I saw an, some, an emulator once. I saw one of those online. It's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, I have an Atari behind me on the desk, but it was just uh -huh. easier to download it from the web, throw it in the emulator, and uh, yeah. okay. try it. So, um, I enjoyed it. I want, I wished I had the manual, and they, the manual has not been scanned. No one has the manual for that game. So, uh, if you do, then... I, I don't. Hmm. I, I threw away all my Atari stuff at some point. I don't even remember doing it, but I looked for them after you got in contact with me. I looked for it. I couldn't find anything. Oh. And so I had my source code, I had the, the diagrams of the other game, the B machine, all the layout of how the screen looked in, mm -hmm. in, in pixels, so I, so I could program it. And I had all that, and just threw it away at some point, I don't know why. Oh, man. Yeah, too bad, I wish I hadn't. I, so do I. <laughs> yeah. I'd ask you for source code and things. Um, so, all right, so you did you just submit it through uh, to APX through the normal channels, and how did that go? Did they... Make any? Did they want anything changed about uh, in the game? Did you know? well, that was that was an interesting experience. I was, um, I was working full time, and where I was working, I didn't really have the freedom to call and do, you know, off work stuff at work. So I had to leave work at lunchtime and call people at Atari to to find out about things. But I somehow found out how you submit a game, and I sent it down to them, and I got a letter back. And I just remember being ext extremely excited. It must have been like when people get a letter back from a, a book publisher or something. I was extremely excited that they wanted my game, you know, that they were interested in it. So um, I probably called them because I'm sure they left a contact in the letter. And uh, what did they want? They didn't want anything changed. They, they had some suggestions. If I wanted to, that was my choice. I could make the game different or better or in their idea better. Or not, they were willing to take it just as it was. But but I, I added some of their suggestions and I added a few more of my own. And by the time I was done, done this game was uh, it completely loaded up. Sixteen was it sixteen K in those days? Uh, could have been, yeah, sixteen yeah. or thirty-two, depending on 
Yeah, it was 16K on the, on the Atari 800 that came with the machine. And then you could add a, an expansion, 32, right. 32K. I'm so right. used to saying Meg. I almost say Meg. <laughs> and I think, right. You know. See, Jiggerbonk but, required 16K. So, yeah. Yeah. It was completely full. I mean, it was, I didn't have more than 100 bytes to spare in memory when I was done with it. It was so full of um, just, just code, you know. Mm -hmm. That was a lot of fun. Whole summer. Nice. Yeah. And uh, then came the Bean Machine, machine yeah. which was your other one. It came out in the summer 1983 catalog yeah. and won one third prize in the entertainment category. Yeah. Do you, do you have a picture of their catalog at all? Yeah. I can't, rem I can't remember. I think they published the wrong version of that game. Really? Is, it, is the picture all in uh, just white, black and white, basically? What does it look like? I, I sent you a link. Um, the picture is uh, uh, white stuff on a blue background, uh -huh. uh, kind of a dark blue background. The game that I just played a little while ago was much more colorful. Yeah, that's it. See, when when they first published the game, they picked the they took the wrong version. I I sent them the wrong version, mm. not knowing that it had a bug in it, and they they I got third price anyway, <laughs> which was kind of. <laughs> Kind of a surprise because it didn't even work. I mean, it didn't work like it was supposed to. And I, I thought, what's going on here? You know, because I got a call from my contact down there, uh -huh. whose name at Atari Program Exchange, his name was um, Mike Downey, I think it was. And Mike said, um, he was excited about the game. It's pretty neat. And I said, is, is there something, there's something unusual about that, though? Because he, he was describing a different game than I had written. It didn't look like my game. He was describing it to me. I said, no, that's, that's not right. Mm -hmm. Something's wrong. There's a bug somewhere. And he goes, well, it looks, looks fine. But the, the problem that we're having with it is that occasionally uh, the beans fly off the, the platforms and they fly all over the screen. And so clearly that's a bug. And so I said, yeah, that's not supposed to do that. It doesn't do that on my machine. I'll have to look into it. And so I had a friend that had an Atari. And I had him run the game and tell me about it. I went over to his house, actually. And son of a gun. It was doing the same thing Mike Donnie's machine was doing, but mine doesn't do. And so I went back and, of course, I looked at code for hours trying to figure out what in the world it could be. And then I called my uh, contact back again, and he was insistent that, you know, this was the code that we, I'd sent them. And I, yeah, it probably is the code, but there's something wrong. It's not what, it doesn't run like that on my machine. It should be color and it should be, you know, quite a bit different than what you're seeing there. And then I, uh, Mike, said he knew somebody at Atari named John Paladich. And I think I saw him in one of your interviews. You, yes, I've in, talked to him. Yeah. yeah. And, and he said he'd put me in touch with, with uh, but he called him Jack. Was that his nickname, Jack? Yes. Yeah, he goes yeah. Okay, because he, he, I knew him as Jack Paladich. And uh, I can't remember if he had Jack call me or if I called Jack, but Jack started thinking about it after I discussed uh, all the symptoms it was doing, all the, you know, why it would work on this machine and not this machine, et cetera. Same code. And he said, you know, the earlier version of the operating system had a little bug in it. I said, oh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. He said, I don't remember exactly, but he said, I think he said, it doesn't save the registers on a certain operating system call. It just, it returns, it can change the value of your register upon return. And I said, well, that can definitely be a problem, but easy to fix. And so I two lines of code and it was fixed. I mean, I just had to save the register go into the operating system call, come back, restore the register as it was, and, and then it worked on all the machines. I had my friend test it, then I sent it down to Mike Downey, and he tested it, hey, this is a whole different game. <laughs> so that, that was kind of an interesting yeah. story. And I won third place on the version that didn't work, which is wow. kind of weird. Wow. But I don't know if they ever published a new version or if they made uh, new copies of the program. And you know, I don't know if anybody got the fixed version from Atari. Uh, I think the version I downloaded, I think, said something like version 1.1, 1. 1, and oh, okay. my version was fine with the right colors and things. So I think yeah. they just pushed a new version out. Okay. But I know that Target stores bought something like 800 copies of that game, and I saw it in a Target store somewhere, long, long, well, way back when they were selling these things. And I don't think I bought one. And I can't remember if uh, if I saw the version that they that they sold on a machine that they were displaying or something, but 
something tells me that the majority of those were the wrong version of the, of the game, which is too bad because, you know, the game's so much better the way it finally came out. Right. Well, the game is a lot of fun. I played it this morning and my research, you know, I was getting ready for this interview and I, I wanted to just keep playing the game. It was, oh, yeah? huh. it was really good. It yeah. really reminded me of what could be a, a modern uh, mobile app sort of game. So yeah. a lot going on, a lot of movement on the screen, a lot of things to manage at once. Yeah. And you know, in Atari, those things that they call sprites, are they called sprites? Yeah. Player missiles or sprites. Yeah. Player missiles. That's what I was trying to think of. Yeah. Player missiles. Couldn't think of the word. Um, well, that game doesn't use them except for a few little items on the side that, that it does, like on the spider, I think, drops down from the, from the sky, etc. But most of that is collision detection that I had to do in code which is a lot different than using the antic to do the collision detection. It's pretty much automated on the antic. It's really simple. I don't remember how to do it now, but um, when you do it in memory map mode, you're literally taking pixels and you're comparing to see if they hit each other. And you have to do that in code. And that can be anywhere on the screen because of the nature of the game. As you saw, it can be just about anywhere that, where the beans collide and then they get destroyed. But um, So that was kind of tricky to program because they... When I first programmed it, it kept getting stuck. They would, they would, you know, they just hold together, and then they wouldn't bounce apart and split up. But I fix, I think I fixed that bug. Did you encounter that at all today when you played it? Yeah, no? it seemed to work fine. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I, if one ball landed, then another ball, one of them would get destroyed, and uh, yeah, yeah. I, like, I like that mechanic. Yep. That's good. More, I had more fun programming it than just about anything I've ever done. I mean, really, in coding, you know. Yeah. The only thing I could say maybe I had more fun doing was when, when I was working for Montana Power and I was a college kid and uh, I worked on the hydroelectric plants on the Missouri River, I, automating their, their uh, generators and, and uh, writing code that would uh, keep track of everything in the dam was just about, you know, it was a lot of fun, that kind of code. But, but this Atari came really close to that. <laughs> So you won a prize, so did they give you uh, uh, some, you could buy have a credit to get some Atari stuff from them? Yeah, yeah. And I got some other games, and I got, uh, I think I got a second hard drive, not hard drive, floppy drive, as opposed to tape drive. I had one, I bought one, and then I think I bought another one with the, with the credits I got. It was, it was a good deal of stuff, you know? It was, it was only third place, so. Yeah. yeah. And how were royalties? Did you make good money off this stuff? I had one really big royalty check, and I assume it was the quarter that Target bought their copies, but I don't remember the amount, but yeah, it wasn't very much. I mean, I don't think it was more than $1,000, probably not even that much, but it was still, I was just doing it for fun. So it's like, I looked at it like this, it paid for the computer. You know? Sure. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so those are the two you did. Did you do other things that uh, that didn't get published, or... Well, I started, I started another, another project with a friend of mine who also had an Atari. This is a different friend than the other one I told you about. But um, what we were going to do was hook our machines up with a modem, you know, via telephone line. And we were writing a program that um, allowed two competitors, two people, individuals, to play chess. Now, the computer didn't play chess. I mean, wow, that wouldn't have worked in the Atari. It would have been really remarkable to make something like that work. But the... Uh, Computers kept, you know, enforced the rules and put up the chess pieces and you, you could move them, drag and drop, and then it would go click, click, click when you moved them. And then um, if you try to move an illegal to an illegal spot, it would, it would do something to prevent you from doing that. So you had to play a legal game of chess if you were going to play it with that. And it was kind of fun to do that. We never finished it. I mean, we got the part done where um, all the screen um, display was working and all the rules enforcement was working and all of that, all the polishing stuff was done. We did that part first. But the part with, uh, I'm trying to remember, I don't think the communications we ever finished or the, um, you know, the actual telecommunications part of it, we never finished. I don't know why, but we could have finished it. We should have finished it. I don't know why we didn't. But I think the market, it looked, looked like it was just falling out of that by then. It was just, the Atari was done. And yeah. It was time to move on to something else, but I never moved on to something else. Is the problem? But whatever. <laughs> I have that problem too. That's why there's two Ataris on my desk behind me. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> well, you really kept with it, though. I did. 
Um, so what haven't I asked you about that time that I should have? Tell me a story. Oh, oh wow. I don't know. I mean, it's a whole different time. Man, technology has moved on. The internet, uh, ethernet, um, just the, the ease of connecting computers together is there's, it's so much more standardized, and all the software has drivers that work on everything. Remember, back in those days, this was in 1983, I'm thinking about, or 82, I guess, when I did this. Modems were really rudimentary. I mean, you could almost whistle on the phone and, and keep up with a modem if you, if you knew how to make the sounds, you know. I knew, I knew a guy that could dial a telephone by whistling into it, but that's a different story. But, but phone, but... Modems have just, I mean, telecommunications has changed so much with the advent of, you know, private networks, first of all. Just the 56K digital networks were, were amazing compared to what we had back in the late, late 70s. And then we moved on to T1, and now it's just so far beyond that, I can't even fathom it. It's just so incredibly advanced compared to what we had. I was thinking just, just the other day, I, I bought a, an Amazon Prime Fire Stick for my TV. And I think amount, the amount of technologies that, that's in this little, looks like the size of a thumb drive almost, plug it into the back of your TV and you're receiving your router's Wi-Fi in, from in your house and you're transmitting uh, TV shows, streaming down the internet. The amount of technology that it takes to do that is just incredible. I mean, it's compared to what, what was available back in the, the days of 300 baud, 1200 baud, you know. And we thought that was pretty amazing when they went to 2400, you know. Wow. 4,800, 9,600. Right. Need I go on? No. It, but it's amazing. <laughs> anyway, so that's one thing is the telecommunications has just, it, along with technology, has just made it so much easier to do this kind of stuff. It's so much easier that it's not any fun anymore, the way I look at it. It's really not. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do I have on this computer? It's not even, it's just a little laptop. And it's something like six gigabytes of main memory. And remember back in the old days of, PCs, you were lucky if you had a make. I mean, 640K was the, the boundary, they called it, uh, the, where the, all the stuff was down below that, that Bill Gates decided this would be the boundary, 640K. Nobody, nobody would ever need, need more than that. Right, it's true. He fam famously said, yeah. Right. But now, but now you can't even have a computer with less than two gigabytes and it's more like eight gigabytes to do anything useful. Right. That's mostly because of the, you know, I'm pre preaching to the choir here, I'm sure. But <laughs> it's just the operating system bloat, and then the, the amount that you do with the graphics and all that, the video and the, everything, you need that much memory. And so much more easy, I should say, to, to deal with it. But it's no fun to program in it because you don't have to conserve anything. Right. I, mean, yeah. I had to conserve bytes when I was working with 16K. And uh, now it's just, what, what's two gigabytes anyway? What, how do I even fathom that? Yeah, so it's a lot of space. I think there was a version of Diggerbunk uh, um, published by Educational Software. Yeah, yeah, they had a uh, story there. Yeah, they, this guy named Robin Shearer contacted me. He was trying to create a company, you know, that could be a good sized company. He was trying to do. I don't think he ever really got it off the ground, but he was looking for software to to add to his uh, saleable items, and uh, he found me. I don't know how, but I sent him the, the uh, I don't think I ever sent him a source. I might have sent him a modified version of it. And uh, <clears throat> it did this, it was the same software basically. But he uh, spent quite a bit of investment packaging that up. He wrote a, I mean, he didn't, he didn't write, he had a graphic artist design a cover for a, a box that it would be, that would be shipped in. And it was pretty elaborate. I was, just wish I hadn't thrown all that stuff away. Oh well. Um, but, Robin, I don't even know why I remember his name. I, I, I got nothing out of this at all from him. He never sent me any royalties. I don't know if he ever sold any of them or not. Hmm. I have a feeling he just went kind of broke and stopped doing it in time. But he used to advertise in game magazines. Yeah. You know, I used to see him a lot in game magazines. He touted mine in, in game magazines, but I don't know if he sold any of them or not. Yeah. If you could send a message to the Atari computer users that still exist, and you can right now, what would you tell them? Oh, that's something that I would need to think about, really. 
before I come up with anything intelligent to say, I mean, just enjoy yourself. Have fun with this. I mean, this is really just a toy, and it, it always will be. It was before, but boy, it's interesting that it's kind of being revived and kept alive by people like you. And I don't know what to tell the users. How about this? Forget about it. That's what I like to think of. <laughs> okay. All right. I think I have what I need, Steve. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Nice talking to you. Nice talking with you. Yeah. Bye.